So today, let me just say what we're going to do. So we're just going to do, you know, um, when I when I show you inner products, I like to show you outer products as well because they're not scary at all, um, and they're always essentially written down in a in a in a in a weird fashion, but they're not scary at all. Um, so I'm just going to do two of these at once, and then we'll come back to tensor products later, um, even though they're all intimately related to each other. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to just briefly mention basis, which I've already mentioned. I started the discussion by a bunch of this stuff. And uh, we're going to do Gram-Schmidt orthogonality, and then we're going to move on to matrices, right? Uh, transformations of vectors and matrices and so on and so forth. So, you know, so I'm just going to move on. So this is not a linear algebra course, as you can probably tell. Uh, but what this is, is it's um, it's... It's emergency relief, like essentially all I'm trying to do is give you the concepts from linear algebra that I know you should have, but perhaps you don't. And so I'm just trying to bridge that gap by uh, putting things in, in, in as casual a fashion as possible, but at the same time showing you a little bit of the notation so that if you open art in or you know any of the books essentially you're not, you know, this doesn't look like Greek to you, right? Um, any more so than it actually is. Okay, uh, any questions, comments from last class? Okay, so we're just, we're just going to con continue our discussion of right? So today specifically we're just going to do inner products, we're going to do metrics, we're going to do outer products. We're going to do basis. And Gram-Schmidt, right? So hopefully we can run through all of these. These are fairly easy ideas. They're ideas that you're very much familiar with uh, one way or the other, like you've heard them a thousand times before. Um, you know, especially in the context of Cartesian uh, geometry, uh, all of you, you know, have done some sort of geometry, so you've heard these ideas before. There's nothing I'm telling you that you already don't know. There are just slight subtleties, maybe, you know, one or two things, and then maybe one or two new ideas. That's all I'm going to introduce to you, right? So Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization, which, you know, uh, which if you look at the two heavy names, looks very foreboding, you already know what the idea is. I guarantee you, you already know what the idea is. Right? If you've at all thought about shadows and sticks, you already know what the idea is. So all I have to do is just point at where that idea is and you already, you know, you just, you can do the thing, right? And it's a bit formal in the sense that, you know, um, I've maybe had to use, technically I've had to use Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization maybe a handful of times, right? But it's one of those really important theorems that you, you know, really important techniques that you want to put away in the back of your you know, uh, in the back of your toolbox, your quantum mechanics toolbox, because it's always the thing, it's kind of a, a single purpose tool, but it's so important that you can't, you know, you can't do without it. It's a little bit like having a, a peeler, right? It does only one thing, which is peel things, but you can't, you can't eat a cucumber without it, right? So this is, you know, this is exactly what Gram-Schmidt does. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's very uniquely used to kind of orthogonalize spaces and, you know, and, and to continue a discussion uh, without having to carry around, you know, stuff. Okay. And the way I'm going to say it, actually, I'm the way I'm going to introduce these ideas as well, is I'm going to tell you what their maps of, you know, what kind of maps they are. And the reason why I'm doing this is basically because um, it's it's a little bit of a personal choice. I don't need to say it this way, but uh, I wish that you would think of them in this way because. Uh, if you think of maps as the general object that you have, right, you know what a map is, right? I have a set, I have another set, and I just want to take objects from one set to another set, right? And so it's a map. I map literally the objects, you know, elements of one set to another set. So you've heard of the idea of maps somewhere, right? And so uh, I like to introduce essentially the map-like way of thinking about these things, because you can think of all of quantum mechanics essentially in that map-like fashion. So if you if you are talking to me about one of the papers, you know, that I'm working on, for instance. I, all of the discussion, or, or much of the discussions, depending on what paper it is, much of the discussions will just be talking about what the map is, and discussing the map, and describing the 
features of the map and so on and so forth. So even though what I'm introducing here, you know, if you go off to do something else, like if you do atomic physics or so on and so forth, this is important but not, you know, you're not missing out much by not noticing the map-like quality of things, but, but if you do anything that is slightly more abstractly mathematical or if you do the stuff that I'm interested in doing, right, um, then it's actually a very powerful way of thinking about all of this stuff and, you know, and uh, it's useful. I mean, this, this, uh, this abstraction is actually very useful in all kinds of other fields as well. So, you know, so I won't talk about it, but I will just simply tell you what kind of objects these, these are, um, what I mean by this map. So let's begin actually, let me show it to you right away without kind of, um, right, again, so the way I urge, I invite you to think about this stuff is the following, which is I have essentially, I give you two vectors, right, and now what all can you make with those two vectors? Suppose I say I give you two vectors and you can return anything you want to me. Can you return a scalar? Yes. We'll see. In fact, the, you know, a good definition of doing that, a map that takes two vectors and spits out a scalar is essentially just the inner product. Can you return a vector? Give me an example. A cross product, right? So it's a map from, you know, bilinear map from vectors to vectors, right? What about, uh, there are some, you know, there's some subtle features there, but let's just ignore that for the moment. What about, I give you two vectors and I want you to return a matrix to it. Can you do that? Come again? Column vectors. What do you do with column vectors? I give you two vectors and I want you to return a matrix to me. Multiply them element by element, right? So I give you vectors A and vector B and I want you to return a matrix M. M i j is essentially A i b j. That works, right? So on and so forth so on and so forth, right? So you're not scared when you essentially look at, you know, you can ask what quantity am I interested in? I'm making a measurement in quantum mechanics, so I'm often interested in what? A probability, right? So I want a quantity which will produce a probability at the end of the day, and that's essentially, you know, transition rates, probabilities, these are the reasons why we're actually doing inner products, right? But if I said, no, no, actually I have, you know, I have, a, I have a machine and I put some light in and some light comes out, right? So the light that's going in is a quantum state, which means it has a vector-like description. The light that's coming out is a quantum state, which means it has another vector-like description. So I want to take vectors to vectors, right? And you can ask what is the map of these things, right? So on and so forth. So that's the reason why I want to essentially make the make this map-like thinking part of your, you know, part of your discussion if I can, right? So inner products are bilinear maps, right? Essentially, I'll write it this way to make it less, um, this is not very good notation, but it serves us very well. So I give you two copies, U is any element of, of the set, V is any element of another copy of the set, right? So last time I had I had essentially written it like that, right? That's exactly the same language, right? So I have a I have the set of all vectors S, right? And I have another copy of the set of all vectors, and I essentially am taking two call one element from here, one element from here, and I return to you a scalar C. Right? We already saw how to do this last time. There is no, I don't want to use kind of this overly hefty language. So this right, is for all practical purposes the only inner product that we want, that we need essentially, right? There's nothing, there's nothing uh, strange or crazy about it, except for one simple fact of subtlety that you have to keep track, which is that there is a star there, right? There is a simple point of subtlety, which is that you have this, you have this complex conjugation, right? Can anyone try and guess why we need the complex conjugation? Never mind the mathematicians. Why do we need the complex conjugation over there? To get to get positive numbers, right? We, uh, numbers. So let's start with numbers because essentially what you want is uh, is if you have 
we don't want complex numbers, we want reals, right? So we want reals to begin with, right? And then what you're going to notice as you can, as you've already intuited is that if I replace u with v, right? v in our product with v, under this definition essentially is the mod square of numbers and the sum of the mod square of numbers, which is positive semi-definite, right? Positive semi-definite, which means zero or greater than zero, right? So for this reason, this is a very good this is a very good definition of inner product, right? Is everyone on the same page? You see what I did. We started with the Sturmgerlach, right? All of these experiments, which produced linearity, which suggested very heavily that we should use linear theories, right? Underneath. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, linearity. I've got that from the experiment. I'll take it and run with it, right? So how do I run with it? I construct linear vector spaces. I already know Born's rule, which you cannot get out of any kind of uh, theoretical framework easily. It's, let's take that as an input to the theory, right? So it's one of the axioms of quantum mechanics, right? The interpretational bit of quantum mechanics. So if you take that, uh, if you take the axioms of quantum mechanics and add Born's rule in there as the way to translate probabilities, right, to theory, to physical theory, then what you need is something that takes you from vectors to numbers, or vectors and operators to numbers, as we'll see, right? And this procedure of getting numbers out are these inner products, right? So there's nothing, there's nothing very strange or clever about it. I just want you to, you know, perhaps clever, but you know, there's nothing strange about any of this, right? So I want to write down the properties that an inner product should satisfy. Right? You can check that all of these properties are obeyed by this, this definition right here. Right? That this definition that I have just written down indeed obeys all of these properties. Right? And just I want to clarify this, this is a very simple point, but I just want to clarify this. What is this n? Right? It's so the dimensionality of the vector, right? So if you have a vector v, right? So it's v1, v2, up to vn, right? And because you already know the relationship between basis and dimensionality here, it's the dimensionality of the vector space as well, right? So, so it's that quantity right there. So the n is understood that way, right? Now. Whenever you have this kind of a quantity, it should remind you of something. Does, it, does this remind you of anything? What is the Euclidean distance between two vectors? Right? Square root of x1 minus x2 square plus y1 minus y2 square, right? That object essentially exactly looks like that. If you take x1 minus x2 as a vector r, then that's just the inner product of r with r. Square root is the length of the vector. Right? So essentially what this does is it relates us very, very naturally to this notion of metrics as well, right? Right? And a metric essentially I'll write it in this language essentially in the in the in the in the vector language right and a metric should satisfy essentially a set of relationships the first of this Right? So you can combine these and write this as an if and only if statement. You can say the metric, so or distance, right? The distance between any two points should be a positive number. Otherwise, I don't know what it means to be, you know, I don't know what it means to be minus four meters away from something. 
right? Has to be a positive number. It better be zero only if I'm standing on the point, right? This is called coincidence or something, right? I forget what the what the name for this is, right? But it's essentially just saying, well, if I say that I, you know, I have to travel zero meters to find me, right? I have to travel zero meters to find my shoes. I made a very philosophical statement. If I have to travel zero meters to find my shoes, right? Then they better, I better be wearing them, right? I, I, they better be right here, right? So this distance you want it to be zero if and only if you're you're actually at the vector, right? So you want right? So this has to be an element of real. Sorry such that it has the following properties. Otherwise, I mean, you should have questioned me immediately what this, mean, what this means, right? Because complex numbers, you have to only partially order them. So what does this mean? So right, let me say it in the least confusing way possible, which is that you have to take, you know, you have to take two vectors, right, x and y, and, and it has to output essentially a real number, such that it has the following properties. It has to output a real positive, essentially, a positive semi-definite real, right? It has the following properties. And the very last one, right? So this thing is essentially just positivity. Right? This I think is called Coincidence, like check if that's what it's called. Uh, this is symmetry. Does anyone know if this is what it's called? Um, and this is triangle inequality. Right? And for us, essentially, if you just take the definition of distance to be um, the absolute value, right? If you take this definition, this is a good definition of distance, right? So we, we'll see this, we'll see this is essentially called, right? But before I do that, what I want to show you is essentially some uh, important examples of metrics. Right? Because again, this is something that, that most people, you know, I don't know if you've seen or not, but I think it's just important for you to see it once in your life just so that you know that, you know, that's the space of discussion that is available to you. So the first example that I want to write down is what's called a discrete metric. And I define discrete metric Right? So here is a, here is a, sorry, I shouldn't write it this way. Right? My apologies. So the discrete metric essentially will simply ask the question, is x equal to y? If you give me two vectors, if they're exactly the same, Right? It just returns the answer zero. If it's not exactly the same, it returns the answer one. Right? You can check that this thing is a metric. So the reason I'm giving you these is so that you check and that you actually sit down today evening, tomorrow afternoon, whenever, and you actually go through the the axioms and go, yeah, that makes sense. You know, those four axioms are being met, and so that makes sense. So another example that I'll give you is just essentially the two norm. Right? also called the Euclidean metric. Right? 
right? You should check that this thing also obeys it. My favorite one to show you Right, let me write it that way. So this is also a metric, right? So have you already guessed why this is called the taxicab metric? Right, so if you imagine essentially a, a part of the city which is perfectly laid out in squares like this, right? To good approximation, right? So, uh, parts of New York City have this. If you want to go from there to there and you want to hire a cab, right? What's that person gonna do? He's not gonna fly you like that. That's not the way that person's gonna travel. Right? If you get into a taxi cab, what this person's gonna do is that. So what you want is the absolute distance in the x direction and the absolute distance in the y direction. And you want to add them and that's how much money you're going to give to this taxi person, right? The driver of the taxi cab. So that's the reason why this metric is defined that way, right? So what I want you to do, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this stuff at all. So what I want you to do is essentially go home and inspect these examples and convince yourself that indeed they're metrics, right? Do this because what this will do is it will sharpen your notion of these mathematical quantities that have been introduced to you almost on an ad hoc basis, right? So when you were in school or an undergrad, they just said, oh, you know, does it not make sense that you would, you know, you would take a rope and this would be the length and, you know, this kind of a definition. Now we're replacing with essentially the same intuition, but slightly more the next level of math, right? We're just introducing one more layer of math in there so that we're, you know, we can comfortably discuss metrics that don't look like metrics, right? That don't immediately kind of, you know, um, that don't make sense to us immediately. We can accept or re reject them, right? The reason why this is important, again, is because um, if, you, if you want to think of the space in which quantum mechanics exists, then part of what you have to do is you have to think about the distance between different things. Uh, if you start thinking in those grand terms, then, you know, you will actually have to construct metrics that look slightly, slightly weird at first, but they're fully justified, right? So the path for that construction is going to be us understanding exactly how metrics are defined, so on and so forth. So I just wanted to add this into your into your little bit of uh, um, education about uh, about metrics, right? So uh, again, uh, if those of you who who bothered to stare at the homework, there's already a ton of problems and so on and so forth surrounding these concepts. So you know, so and I'm also giving you examples here that I urge you to prove. So you know, there is more than enough work that I'm leaving behind essentially. Uh, for you to kind of, um, yeah? Because that's exactly the point I was trying to make, which is I'm just trying to broaden your education a little bit. We don't need any of these essentially for your standard quantum mechanics course that's going to follow from like, you know, uh, from half an hour from now. Um, essentially, I'm introducing these simply because I want you to understand that the notion of distance right, is an abstract discussion, is an, is an abstract idea, right? I want you to think of distance as an abstract idea. When I say two things are, you know, two things are a particular distance from each other, right? It makes, it makes sense to us if I say, hey, my office is that far away, right? You have to go over there and you have to, you know, that's how far my office is. This makes perfect sense to you. Suppose I show you, suppose I want, you know, I, I want to paint some wall, right? And I come to you and I show you two colors, both of which at first appear red, but you can clearly tell they're just slightly different colors, right? And you say to me, hey, these look quite close to each other. You would say, you would use a phrase like that. The point I'm trying to make to you is that you can actually quantify that. You can quantify exactly what that sentence means, right? What you have to do is you have to consider the space in which colors exist, and in that space you can construct a distance. 
right? So what I'm trying to say to you is essentially that quantum mechanics is not actually the first place you should come across this idea. I, I hope that you've already come across this before, but you know, if you haven't, well, you know, we just have to do it now. Um, so let me show you that example that I just said. How do you represent all colors, right? So it's a combination of essentially red, blue, and green. And why have I drawn a triangle? Because if I take 50% blue, 50% red, 50% red, green, right, I'm actually incredibly bad at colors. You get whatever color is in the middle there. Does anyone know? Is anyone good with colors? Red plus green divided by two? Greenish red, I like it. Greenish red, yes, you know. Forever, forever you're on video alongside with me, uh, expressing <laughs> your disinterest in colors, right? So whatever this color is. And, uh, and if, you, if you take exact center, so on the other hand, if you take blue and red, right? When I slide along this axis, I'm sliding along the blue-red axis, right? So pure blue is over there, pure green is over there, and pure red is over there. Of course, I can, I can denote them by a vector. Right? I can denote them by these three vectors. And if I mix them by some probability, so I say I mix green with probability p, red with probability one minus p, I'm actually traveling along this line. What I mean is my paint is made of 70% green, 30% red, right? The paint that I'm gonna paint the wall with. On the other hand, if I, if I choose a different proportion of green, red, and blue, I traverse this entire thing, right? So now you can answer the question that we asked before, which is, you can say, hey, there are two colors that look kind of reddish. How far are they from each other? There is the answer, right? So what I am actually trying to teach you without, you know, saying it out loud in terms of, uh, you know, in too mathematical a language, is that what you have to do is you have to take the space that you're interested in. In our case, it will be quantum states, right? Wave functions. And you have to consider the geometry of those quantum states. Where do they live? What is the space that they live on? And once you put down the geometry of the quantum states, you can put down the distances between several states, right? Again, this is not a discussion I want to really take on in this class, but because I'm doing vector spaces, I like to introduce two, three concepts that will take you just, if you just spend another 20 minutes outside class, you can glean a huge amount more about quantum states and how to think about them and so on and so forth, right? This is important because if you're doing an experiment, right, and you say, I want to produce this particular thing, I want to produce, you know, the first excited state of the hydrogen atom, right, in this particular configuration, I write down all the details for you. Now, the question that I can ask you is how close did you get in an experiment, right? I give you a laser beam and I say, please tell me what this laser beam is, right? You want to characterize it, so you want to write down the quantum state for the laser beam, right? So the question is, how close to a given ideal scenario did you get in an actual experiment? To answer these kinds of how close questions, you have to pursue this mathematics, right? And that's the reason that I'm introducing this to you. I think it's very, very important and is essentially, you know, um, well, I mean, by the by, I mean, this is, in some complicated fashion, this is exactly what you're going to learn in your GR courses as well. I mean, in a, in a, in a, in a different setting, this is what you're going to learn in GR courses as well, which is how to properly metricize spaces, right? And how to write down distances and so on and so on. This is, I mean, you're going to do this in 17 places, right? And so that's the reason that, that, that I wanted to introduce this to you. Not, I mean, not to, not to confuse you, but hopefully to actually enlighten the space that, you know, that, uh, that these metrics are sitting in, right? Um, so bottom line, it depends on what you're interested in. Right? You have to define based on your interest and a set of properties that have to be obeyed, right? A metric, you have to propose a metric that satisfies these properties. And once the properties are satisfied, you can play around with it. You can say, what are the consequences, right? Maybe I'm actually colorblind, I can't see blue, right? Then I actually don't care where on this, where on this line you are on, right? So all, all this entire line is the same color to me because I can't see the blue. All I can see is the proportion of green and red. If that's the case, then the distance measure that you would propose would be different for me, right? Would simply ignore that degree of freedom that I can't see, right? 
So, so on and so forth. You should play with this idea. It's a very powerful, it's a very cute, it's a very powerful idea and it's available everywhere. I mean, it's available in classical mechanics, statistics, so on and so forth, probability theories, right? So you should play with this idea particularly. This is an example of a probability space, by the way, because I'm just mixing with some probability. So some point here actually is defined as probability P for me to have green, probability Q for me to, sorry, probability P for me to have red, probability Q for me to have green, and probability one minus P minus Q to have blue, right? So that's the blue, uh, that's the red, and that's the green. Right? So it's actually a two-dimensional probability vector, uh, three-dimensional, sorry, probability vector, right? And that's cool. You learned something today, right? So the next time somebody says, oh, that wall is white, you can actually quantify this. How white, right? I mean, how do you think Asian paints or, you know, any of these paint companies work in the background? They have, they have proper distance measures. So they know, I mean, they'll sell it to the customer says, you know, Kayan or whatever, like I don't, I can't even pronounce these names, or, you know, um, like turquoise, and, you know. They'll, they'll use all these fashionable words so that customers like them, but in the background, they're just probability vectors, right? So, um, so that's, you know, so I just wanted to, so that's the definition of inner products and metrics, right? Now, the idea that you had proposed, I think, if I give you two vectors and I want you to produce a matrix for me, right, suggest a way to do it, right, the one that he said, right? So what you can do essentially is, right, so let me say it before, or let me say it this way, right? So what we just saw was I give you two vectors, right? And you give me back essentially a complex number. And what we saw was a, was a nice way of doing it, a way that avoids uh, essentially some traps, right? A, a properly defined way of doing it. And this procedure essentially is the, is the definition of an inner product. And this is all that we'll deal with. But again, I'm here and I want to just point out to you that if I give you you can also produce for me essentially a matrix, right? How do you do it? What you can do is essentially you can say, I will define my matrix essentially to be this matrix M, the ijth element of this will be ui vj star. I choose this definition. You could have chosen ui star vj, you could have chosen ui vj, so on and so forth, right? You could have chosen any number of things. The star, this complex conjugation is a choice of mine, right? So what does this matrix look like? So let's write it out. The matrix M, if I write it out in full, kind of full-blown glory, right? So let me write it for a three-dimensional vector. Right? So I take the V and I have to do star. Right? Now what do I get? Right? So fill out the three by three matrix in this particular fashion. Is this clear to everyone? Is this clear to everyone in the back? This quantity is not scary to you, right? There's nothing surprising about it, right? Now, what did we do when we constructed inner products, right? So when I said U V, right, is sum over U I star V I, right? What did I do? Whenever I took a vector V, so we said, let's imagine that these right-handed, these ket vectors are the natural objects, so I just write them with their index, vi, right? Whenever I see this flipped object, this bra, right? I'll write the u, I'll write the u with a star, with a complex conjugation. Now, what do you have here? You have the u is natural, right? It's just coming as its own index. So, the, so if I was to write m in a matrix, in a compact notation, I would just write u, right? 
because that's u. V is coming with what? With a complex conjugation. So if I write this, that's the same object, right? And you're not scared of it. It's not mysterious. It's yet another map that you can produce, right? It's a bilinear map. It takes, it essentially takes two vectors and instead of putting out a, a number, which is what we did with inner products, it puts out a matrix, right? Does this, does this sound complicated to anyone? No, I'm talking about, yes, maps are operators, but they're special kinds of operators. So when I refer to maps, what I said was I have a set S, right? And I have another set S prime, another copy, and I consider the set of, you know, the field F, which is complex numbers for us. Now what you can do is essentially, you can take two copies and you can go down to the field, and that's the inner product. That's the map that I'm talking about. This map which takes in, right, which takes in two, two vectors and, and puts out a number, right? So I want you to appreciate, what is this? This is a procedure. What is the procedure? Think of it like a box. You input into the box two vectors, it spits out a number at you, right? So that's what I mean when I say map. But you could do something else. You could say, hey, I actually give you a vector, I want you to produce another vector, right? So a map from vectors to itself, and that's another kind of object. What is this? When a, what does it physically mean for a vector to change? Right? What what is this? Transformation of what? Transformation of the vector. What is a vector? For us, what is a vector? For us, when we are studying quantum mechanics. Right? It's the description of what is happening, right? It's the it's the underlying thing that we you tell me what the quantum state is, right? which is just a vector. You tell me what the quantum state is and I can tell you what is happening. All the physics of what is happening, I can just tell you back again, right? So for us, a vector is actually what's happening. So when I take a vector and I, I in, you give me a vector, I give you back another vector, what could I be doing? Come again? Describing another state, but it's this state changing to another state. So it's evolution. Right? It's how things move in our universe. So that description of, you know, essentially a map from the set of all states to itself, right? Is essentially what is evolution for us, quantum evolution. Um, right, so, so where was I? Let me collect my thoughts again. So the point I want to make to you is that, is that I'm introducing to you in a kind of slightly mathematically refined language, the same thing that you already know before, which is just inner products. Why did I do that? Because then I can introduce outer products as well. Now that you start thinking in these terms, there are all kinds of other things that can spit out, you know, that I can give you. Tensor products, which we will get to at some point in an extra lecture, is also something that I can produce from here. Again, with, you know, 20 seconds of work, but I don't want to introduce new things to you again. So, just hang on to this. This is very, very important because this is operators are actually this object right here, is an example of an operator, right? So that's the reason that I wanted to introduce it to you. Okay. So let me leave this list here so that we can just work down, work our way down the list. Now we're ready to actually ask yet another question, which is, what do I need to describe arbitrary vectors in this, in this space, right? So suppose I gave you the same example that I, that I gave you before. Right? The motivation of it, just think of the unit x vector, right? The unit y vector and the unit z vector. And ask yourself why you made these three specific choices. Right? And we discussed this. One is because we want to describe everything that's in three dimensions, right? So that's the reason why we only kept, we kept all three and we didn't keep only two. Now if he had kept a fourth one, which was essentially some, you know, minus z, right? That's overshooting, that's keeping too many vectors, right? 
So we want essentially these two ideas to be built into our notion of what a, ve what a vector basis is, right? This happens to be orthogonal, but orthogonality is not a requirement, right? As, as I have emphasized over and over again, hopefully, right? Orthogonality is not a requirement and, and, and you'll see, I think there is maybe an exercise on this as well. Um, so the two important, right, so this is the motivation. Right, think of this motivation by thinking of, you know, dropping Z, right, and adding minus Z. Both of these are unnecessary things to do, or rather, those, both of these are not allowed in the definition of what a basis is. So that's the reason why I wrote those things down, and hopefully that intuition remains with you. But a basis, Sorry, is, is there a question? Is somebody asking me something? Right. It satisfies only two conditions. One, linear independence, and it simply states, mathematically it's stated as sum over ci times i equals zero implies, and is implied by that ci equals zero. And two, Right? Right? So a basis is a set of D vectors, right? D vectors, and that's the dimensionality of the vector space that we'll assign. So if we have D basis vectors, we'll call it a D dimensional vector space, such that it essentially is linearly independent, which means essentially that you don't overcount, and that it resolves the identity, which means you don't undercount, right? And to see why the first idea is overcounting and the second idea is undercounting, this is I think problem one and problem two of your homework, essentially, right? And you'll see that this is this is exactly that it'll pan out that way, right? So go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is just the identity matrix, in that's what that's what that is. Yeah. So the reason for it, I'll tell you the kind of the the simple way of thinking about it, and um, uh, and uh, you can. You can think through this point is uh, is the following. What is the identity matrix defined as? If I said, you know, I don't know what the identity matrix is, tell me a property of the identity matrix, what would you say? Anything that you multiply, you know, it with, it produces the same thing, right? So essentially the, the understanding that you have of the identity matrix is identity matrix times any vector is the vector itself, right? For all vectors that are essentially part of the set, right? Part of the vector space, right? Now you can see the connection between these two things. This is undercounting, right? This is do not undercount. Right? And this thing is do not overcount, right? And you can see why the second thing is do not undercount because imagine that there is a vector v such that, right? Imagine that I take the sum over i going from one to d, i, i, and imagine that there is a vector v, right? Such that when you multiply 
when you multiply this entire thing with the vector v, it does not return the vector v. What does it mean? Physically, like, you know, intuitively what is happening? You can see what is happening by removing the z from our analysis before. So imagine that I only give you a vector space which has x and y and z is gone. So now if I take a vector, right, so the basis is written right here. Now if I take a vector v, which is like, where is z, okay, vz, vy, vx. If I take a vector v like this, right, and I multiply essentially x, x on this and y, y on this, so I remove, so I'm removing from my basis z, right? So I'm playing this game. What is this? This is the outer product of a vector with itself. We just defined it. And you can just check that this is essentially 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. This is what this vector is. You can just check this by the definition that I gave you. Likewise, this is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. So this object, I can write what this is. It's 0, 1, 1 along the diagonals and then zeros everywhere. Now I take this object and I think that this is my identity, right? I think that this is my identity. So what I do is I say, aha, let me check by multiplying with the vector v. So I get 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1 on vz, vy and vx, right? What does this produce? Three zeros acting on this is zero. 0, 1, 0 acting on this is Vy, 0, 0, 1 acting on this is Vx. So you see the upper number has disappeared, right? The upper number has disappeared. What does it mean? Any vector V which is off the plane, if you multiply with your identity, which is not a correct identity, it doesn't return the same vector. If it's in the plane, then it returns the vector, right? So that's the resolution of identity. What it says is it says because any vector, right, because the identity operator is defined as the operator that if when you multiply it with any vector returns the same vector, check that this is true. Check that this is true, right? For our purposes, essentially in finite dimensions, if you just add all the vectors in this particular fashion, the outer product is defined for you. If you add all of the, or, or, or you take all of the outer products and you just add all of those matrices, what you will end up with, the object that you will end up with, if it's just the identity matrix, which is just ones along the diagonal in D dimensions, you're done. It's proof that this thing is just the resolution of identity, right? It resolves the identity. This is the way to say it, right? So that's the, yeah, go for it. No. Orthogonality is not a requirement. Yes, so what you need to establish is linear independence as well, right? And, uh, sorry, what was the example? One, zero, one, zero, zero, okay. One, one, zero, and one, one, one. Yeah, those are linear independent, yeah. Yes, so what you have to do, uh, I don't know, yeah. Always this, this, this happens, your dual space looks weird. So my definition of outer product, which is just to flip and then write the stars, is you have to work on that, essentially. There are two procedures, right? The procedure that literally everyone, every, that we will use essentially, is to gram schmidt orthogonalize that space, and you have orthogonal vectors, no problems, you just proceed as before, right? There is the mathematician's approach, which essentially de involves defining your dual in some funny way so that you recover the identity operator. It's perfectly, there's nothing funny about it. It's perfectly consistent, right? No, no, yes, so there's just some scale factors that you have to multiply things with, such that when you multiply them with scale factors, everything goes back, right? This is a complicated discussion. Let's just leave it alone for the moment, right? So, but anyway, I mean, the the real point is that every, um, every time that, you know, I have an example, I even have an example here that I'm refusing to write down because last year and the, and the years before, people have just gotten confused by this. It, just, it takes them on a tangent which I don't want to go, right? But just come after the class and I'll show you the example, right? Um, okay, so essentially what we are going to do is the following, right? So the question that he's asking, let me just, 
summarize my point about the question that he's asking. The question that he's asking is if your basis is not orthonormal, right? You just told me that my basis doesn't have to be orthonormal. If it's orthonormal, then what do I do? What do I do if the basis is not orthonormal, right? And my answer to you is essentially you just gram schmidt it, right? This is a procedure, this is a machine of mathematical formula, right? Which takes in essentially vectors that are not orthogonal and, and, and outputs vectors that are orthogonal, right? And so with, those, with, with this procedure essentially you can just ignore the previous problem, right? Which is, I would just say is the, is the, is the least satisfying answer that I can give you. No, you don't. I'm just saying, I'm claiming to you without any sense of uh, proof. I'm claiming to you that you can do this for uh, for vector spaces even without. But I'm just, you know, telling you that practically speaking for, you know, to proceed with our quantum mechanics class, practically speaking, this was not an issue, right? I would actually even be surprised if you ever run into a non-orthogonal basis. I, you know, I can probably remember the number of times I've run into it, you know? So uh, typically everything that, that, that you'll construct will be very carefully orthogonal, right? Okay, so let me remove this and let me discuss the very last thing that I wanted to discuss before we leave. And this is, this procedure is called Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization, right? And essentially the question that, you know, that again, you know, uh, that comes up is, well, what if? What if I am an evil person and I give you a basis that is not orthogonal, right? And what this procedure essentially tells you is how to turn two non-orthogonal, you know, n non-orthogonal vectors into orthogonal vectors, right? But let's just do it. And I promise to you that, you know, you already know Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization, right? So let's just do it. Let's do it in pictures, right? Suppose I give you, I want you to describe vectors in two dimensions, and I give you these two basis vectors. So this is the unit x, and this is the unit y, right? You can describe every vector now, right? Just something x plus something y. Suppose I'm strange, right? I'm a very, very strange person, and I give you not y, but I give you y prime. It's a unit vector, but it's pointed somewhere else. What will you do? What will you do, practically? I give you x and y prime and I say, please construct vectors. Do whatever you want. Well, uh, yeah, the answer is you'll ignore me and just use x and y. Right? You're allowed to make guesses. You can just say, well, I'm just going to ignore you and go back to, you know. But what are you doing when you do that? Right? It's the thing that he's saying. Right? But again, because many of you have read Grunge with orthogonalization, right? The answer comes easy. So what you what you should have done, right, is just ignore me and use the use the y-axis anyway. Right? And then when I come back to you and say, what is this y-axis? I don't recognize a y-axis. I gave you a y prime. You can say, hey, yeah, yeah, but these two are related to each other. You know how you gave me a y prime, right? If you just drop the shadow, which you know how to do, what is the shadow of two vectors, right? It's given by the dot product, right? So if I just take the shadow, then part of it's the x, the original one that you gave me, and the other part is what I'm calling y, right? Is that perfectly obvious to everyone? This geometric construction is exactly what you would do. You would just essentially use the ortho orthonormal basis that is constructed out of x, so you leave the first one. So step number one, you know, whatever I give you, suppose I don't even give you, I don't even give you two orthogonal vector, uh, two normalized vectors. I just give you some vector x and some other vector y. I give you two random vectors, right? Now what do you do? Well, you'll take essentially x and you will construct an x which is just x divided by the length of x. 
right? So take x and essentially output the unit vector that points in the same direction, normalize the vector, right? This is what the first step you would do. The second step you would do is take y, right? And essentially remove Right? Is, is it y times y dotted with x? Let me get the formula correct, sorry. Right? What you would do is you would take the dot product, which is what this object is for real vectors. You take the dot product of y with x, right? This is pointing, so what this does is this vector you can think of as something along this, you know, c x times the x direction and c y times the y direction. I can think of it this way, right? Because it's some vector along y. So what you would do essentially is you would say, you would take y, right? Which is c x times x plus c y times y. And you would ask what is y dot x? This is just c x, right? Now if you take y minus y dot x dot times the x vector. This is just the definition of cy times y. Agreed? Everyone on the same page? If we just divide by cy, that's just y. Right? That's the exact same procedure that I've written here. Right? So now if I just turn all of these into our new notation of cats. Right? What I would do is I would take x and I would remove essentially the length of x, right? This thing is the square root of x with itself. That thing is a positive semi-definite number, so, right? What is the only reason that this procedure would fail? If there's no shadow. If I give you two copies of x and I say please produce, right? But you have two copies of x, you're over counting. And that's the other bit, right? So this is Gram-Schutt orthogonalization. There is nothing mysterious about this. So suppose I gave you essentially, well, if I extended the, the, the axis and I said actually there is three vectors that I give you, three random vectors that are pointed like this, right? So one, two, and three, right? Three random vectors pointed in a cone I give you, right? And I say, for, I say to you, please construct a basis out of this, an orthonormal basis out of this. What do you do? Take the first one, it doesn't matter. Just normalize it. And it's a unit vector, it's pointing along some direction. Take the shadow of the second one onto the first, subtract, normalize, you have another vector. Take the two shadows off of the third one, rinse and repeat. That's it, that's Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. Nothing mysterious, right? And so I've given you an example where I've asked you to work through this. So let me just write this formally. So if I give you w1, w2, up to wn, what do you do? You construct v1, which is w1 divided by the norm of w1. You construct vk plus one, which is v, wk plus one minus sum i going from one to k, vi, wk plus one, vi divided by the norm of the numerator, All right? Does everyone understand this procedure? Take your vector, new vector, take away all the old shadows pointing in that direction, don't point them in weird directions, cx times x, cy times y, cz times z, right? Take those off in the correct direction. And then whatever is left is just your new unit vector, just normalize it. Kam khatam, right? You're done. That's it, that's Gram-Schutt orthogonalization and essentially it will allow us to, to basically not um, have to worry about orthogonal, orthogonality. So I will take essentially in, in, in most classes that we will deal with, whenever I write down a basis, it will automatically be orthonormal, right? It's not required.
just want you to remember in the back of your heads, it's not required, right? It's not required. It's been made to do that essentially so that it's very convenient to do all kinds of calculations. All kinds of inner products drop out essentially if they're, if they're off diagonals, that's the reason, right? Unless there's something in the middle, right? Come again? Yes. Yes. Oh, you, you could just check with complex vectors and you will get a sign problem. Essentially, you'll have a CX. So what did you do? So what did you do when you had Y, right? So for Y vector, you had CX, X plus CY, Y. Let me take this to be complex in general. If you do it the wrong way, what will happen is you will do Y minus CX star X. And these won't cancel. So you have to do it the right way around. That's all. Right? So let me stop here. And then what we'll do next class um, onwards is essentially just move on to matrices. Right? We'll chug along. I'll introduce unitary operators. I'll introduce Hermitian operators, anti-Hermitian operators. The whole, the whole shebang. Like, I mean, next class we're essentially going to see the whole spectrum of, um, you know, several operators that are going to be very, very important. Mm -hmm.